This October, join But Why Though in support of St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. St. Jude is committed to transforming cancer care with the goal of curing at least 60% of children worldwide with six of the most common forms of cancer by 2030. Uh, with your support, you will help St. Jude stay true to its li life-saving mission, finding cures, saving children. Donate to support the treatment of childhood cancer around the world at stjude.org slash though. Again, that's stjude.org slash B-U-T-W-H-Y-T-H-O. Hey everyone, welcome back to But Why Though the podcast, and today we are talking about Jordan Peele. As always, I'm your host Kate, I'm here with Adrian. Hey, how's it going? And Matt. Hello. And the special guest, Nisha. Hey. So we're talking Jordan Peele today because it's still, it's the end of spooky month. And right now there's pretty much nobody spookier than Jordan Peele. Um, so I wanted to cover him and go into why he's not only an awesome comedian, but he's also pretty kind of single-handedly changing the face of American horror right now. Uh, which I think is really cool. But Nisha, why don't you tell everybody why uh, why we brought you on and where people can find you on the internet? Um, okay, so I am from, y'all can find me on the internet at Nisha Plays, it's N-E-Y-S-H-A-P-L-A-Y-S on Twitter and Instagram. Um, I write for But Why Though, and I also have podcasts within the network as well. So yeah, that's where y'all can find me um kate's my other co-host and best friend so oh also i love horror so to answer your question the reason why y'all brought me on here kate knows this love jordan peele from like basically when he was just like me com doing comedy and then finding out he does horror and that he really good at horror that made me love him even more so i think that's why y'all have me here yes it is um also i found out there's a chicago connection Oh no! Huh? Is, is, is she's just gonna come back. Like you just have Anytime to come for every Chicago from, person. Yes, Live there for a year. From Chicago, Nisha has to come down automatically. Nisha's here. <laughs> Yay! And now that I'm actually within the vicinity to be text as a Chicagoan, I can say <laughs> I live in Chicago now. <laughs> um, but anyway, so we're gonna start this off with a question. What do you know jo Jordan Peele for? Matt, you can go first. Um, He did the little Comedy Central TV show that I saw some episodes and a few of the skits. That's about all I know about Jordan Peele. Obviously, he did some movies, which is why we're talking about him, which I have not seen any of those. Uh, I, I can go next. Um, I didn't realize that he was on Matt TV. I, I guess, like, um, the Jordan Peele and, like, when he's doing the stuff with Keegan, Michael Key, like... All that stuff just goes together in my head. So I don't know why I thought like the 50 Cent thing was on Key and Peel, even though that's like timeline doesn't make any sense. I guess I stopped watching Mad TV like in the early 2000s. So I didn't know that he was on there. But I think what I know him for the most is, of course, is uh, Key and Peel, which is really, really, really good. And then, of course, like the horror stuff. But, you know, I don't. I, I don't know what genre. I mean, I'm sure we're gonna get a, a lesson on how Jordan Peele's like his own like genre thing, because that's what we do every horror episode. But I can watch those movies and not be scared, so it's it's good. I like those ones. Um. So for me, I first knew him. I never. I've never actually seen a full episode of Key and Peele. I only ever saw what got posted on Facebook after an episode of Key and Peele. So I know, like, a few of the skits, like, the famous ones, um, but I never really watched them just because I am not really a skit-watching person. Um, that's not, like, I would rather watch, like, a long-form TV show than, I would rather watch a comedy TV show than, like, a skit show. Um, same thing for, I mean, I watched Mad TV, TV as a kid, but I don't remember him, um, because I think I stopped watching before he was even on there. Um... But yeah, I know him for all of his horror stuff because social horror is my favorite thing and he sparked the resurgence of that, which I'm super thankful for. And the man just loves horror as a genre and when you get him talking about it and you get to listen to him talk about it, it's really amazing. So that's what I know him for. Nisha? Um, so yeah, I was actually, so for me, the first thought that pops in my head with Jordan Peele is definitely Mad TV. 
because that's where I was first introduced to him from. And then it goes from that to Kim Peel. And then it's like all the horror stuff. Because I had no idea he had any interest in horror the whole time, like with comedy. I just never thought of him as a horror guy. But then like, he's really good at it. So that's where I know him from. So how many horror movies has he actually done? He's done two so far. He's done two so far. He has two in the works. And then he has, uh, he's produced three horror projects and then, or four horror projects and then two non-horror projects with Monkey Paul. And social horror is a term. So uh, horror people ask me and be like, yeah, yeah, Jordan Peele's social horror. That's the correct term. Yes, yeah, so gotcha. gotcha. Also, the whole is get out of is get out of horror movie is dumb because Jordan Peele has literally just said it's a horror movie and you should just listen to the director who made the movie. Yeah, I mean that makes sense. I don't Yeah. I'm not even a horror person and I would argue that that's a horror movie for sure. Did you watch the movie? Definitely a horror. <laughs> yeah. Um but yeah, so we're going to do the intro to him which is going to be really short. And then we're going to jump into his work, because his work is why he's important. Uh, So Jordan Peele was born in 1979. He's an American actor, voice actor, comedian, writer, director, and producer. Like, the man does it all. He started his comedy career at Boom Chicago in Amsterdam and Second City in Chicago. And his breakout role came in 2003 when he was hired as a cast member on Fox's Mad TV where he spent five seasons and then left in 2008. Um, That's where he met Keegan-Michael Key, and the two of them were ultimately ended up getting cast together in a lot of their stuff, because, or in a lot of the skits, because of their great comedic chemistry. Peel performed celebrity impersonations, which included Carol Spinney, the voice of Big Big Bird, Ja Rule, James Brown, Flavor Flav, Justin Guarani, Montel Williams, Morgan Freeman, Timbaland, and Forrest Whitaker. Um, Peel was absent from the first four episodes of his second season for Mad TV, and ultimately, the funniest thing that I found looking at his comedy background on these shows was that Peel auditioned to be a cast member on Saturday Night Live because the SNL producers were looking for someone to play Barack Obama. But... (laughs) This is around the time, so this is around the time when SNL and Mad TV and other scripted shows were put on hiatus because of the Writers Guild strike, and ultimately Peel remained at Mad TV, and the role at SNL went to Fred Armisen. Fred Armisen is Barack Obama. I put a link in the show notes. Fred <laughs> I Armisen. I still never understood that logic, Barack but I understand. Obama. <laughs> Until Fred Armisen was replaced in 2012 with Jay Farrow. <laughs> yes. Fred Armisen played Barack Obama. And I I looked at it. I looked at pictures and he just looks like Fred Armisen. He, <laughs> he just looks like Fred Armisen. There was, yeah. yeah, if you ever want an example of SNL's bad history with characters of color, or, uh, you know, comedians of color. Yeah. what is this just don't do it like just don't have an obama if that this is what you're gonna go with this is bad listeners i've never seen this in my life because in my head because i never saw this before because in my head jordan peele is obama because he does such a great job with uh, him and luther uh, the anger translator in key and peele <laughs> so this hurts me this watching this hurts yeah and for those of you who don't know uh fred armison is a white latino i think he's argentinian or his family's argentinian um but he looks like a whole white man <laughs> as as barack obama He's not even good. It's not even good. Like the voices, like there's no inflection there. There's no hand. I, it's not even good. Like why is this a thing? Mm-mm. Oh God, why? <laughs> Jesus. They didn't have any other black men. <laughs> <laughs> Could have brought somebody. It's like Pick the same someone issue. Anywhere, anywhere. I mean, they didn't have two anywhere. black women until like I don't even know, not that long ago, and then one of them left. So. If they could have got like an impersonator off the street, probably, and like just been like, "Hey, <laughs> go for it," it would have been better than that. Probably. Yeah. Um. But yeah. So that's where we're gonna stop, like the intro into his stuff, because his comedy and his TV work is about why though, as to why a lot of people know him and how he's been uh, impactful. 
Uh, so we're going to get into his comedy after this word from us about St. Jude. Join supporters around the world and raise money for the kids of St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, where families never receive a bill for treatment, travel, housing, or food, because all a family should worry about is helping their child live. Each year, approximately 16,000 children and teens in the U.S. are diagnosed with cancer. One in five of these children won't survive. St. Jude won't stop until no child dies from cancer. It is estimated that more than 400,000 children worldwide develop cancer each year, and nearly half of them are never diagnosed. St. Jude won't stop until no child dies from cancer. Donate today at stjude.org slash butwhythe to join the fight to cure childhood cancer again. That is stjude.org slash butwhythe to donate now. So following uh, Mad TV, he ended up working with Keegan-Michael Key on uh, the Comedy Central sketch show Key and Peele, which aired from 2012 to 2015. And the series was a, it was a the series was a success with viewers and spawned several skits and videos that essentially went viral online. Those are pretty much the only ones I know, really, because I just don't watch sketch shows. Um, but in the first three seasons, an episode would consist of a cold opening and then a short sketch. After the intro plays, the two hosts would introduce themselves to a studio audience and explain a possible situation, with the following sketch having a similar situation. The show then follows this pattern with a number of sketches and each of the number vary uh, the number of sketches varies each times um and not all segments are introduced as a studio segment and then in the last two seasons the show eschewed studio audience in favor of a pre-shot narrative featuring the duo discussing the concept during a car ride as the introduction for their sketches Is that because they just ripped um, off the Chappelle show yeah so that's why i brought that up because dave Chappelle said even though he loved their show that they ripped it off but they ripped it they off. They didn't rip off. They No, they didn't rip off Dave Chappelle because that format for sketch shows has literally been around since sketch shows started. Yeah. Nickelodeon's yeah. all that literally that. did this. Yeah. Right. I, yeah, all I, I know is they I, let Dave would, Chappelle go and we got King no. and Pill and it wasn't that good compared no. to Dave Chappelle. Sorry. Carlos Mencia it's was doing different. the same thing at the same time that Dave yeah. Chappelle was doing it. I would, Carlos Mencia literally Are you trying to talk about show. Dave Chappelle to Carlos Mencia right now? I'm not comparing their comedy. I'm, compar- <laughs> I'm comparing if anything, their sketch show. Do to do and get out. <laughs> you remember the line, though. You remember the line, though, is all I'm saying. I don't think I can repeat half of uh, what Dave Chappelle's lines, I know. No, that's fair. <laughs> I'm saying literally Comedy Central, <laughs> Comedy Central had another sketch show with the exact same format going on at the same time. And then once those ended, they had another sketch show with the same format. But they weren't like, actually, but just, everybody knows Dave Chappelle sketch, did not want to it, end the show. That's fine. They didn't steal the format because not it's gosh. literally just, it's just the format of a sketch show. Yeah, and I don't even think it's like it's not. I don't think it's a keen to like key or to Dave Chappelle. I like th- I think you're all that one makes more sense at least in my head because like they're just jokey dumb sketches. They're not like it's not Rick James slapping people for you know a whole chronicle of things or they're not doing Clayton Bigsby. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. <laughs> you heard it here first. Dave Chappelle copied all okay. of that. All that was first. <laughs> So the first two seasons of Key and Peel received positive reviews and they maintained a 74 on Metacritic for both of them. And then the third season of Key and Peel received an 82 on Metacritic. And the series ended up winning a Peabody Award in 2013 for its stars and their creative teens inspired satirical riffs on a racially divided and racially conjoined culture. Um, in 2012, during an interview with Jimmy Fallon, President Barack Obama told the story of how he had watched Key and Peele's sketch of himself with Luther, his anger translator, saying it was pretty good stuff. And then in 2015, during the White House Correspondents' Dinner, which if you don't know what that is, it's an entire dinner that is just roasting the president and his cabinet, uh, Key reprised the role of Luther with with Obama as his anger translator. And it's probably one of the best things I have ever seen. It is very, very good uh, because art meets life. It's my favorite. <laughs> it's so good. But yeah, so what are your favorite Key and Peele sketches? Because the, the three that I know the most are Luther the Anchor Translator, the football names one, because I don't know why that one makes me laugh very hard, but it does. 
Um, and then black substitute teacher because he mispronounces all the white kids' names. And it's A A Ron. A A Ron. <laughs> um, so those are my favorites. Uh, do, do me last. Do me okay. last. Okay. I'll go. Um, oh, Matt, do you want to go? Sure. Um, obviously, the three that Kate said, and I guess the other presidential one, not the angry translator one, but I guess with the, the handshake one, which I don't know if that's even part of the same skit, to be honest. I don't think it's a part of the same skit. Are you talking about the one who reads the handshake? Yeah, that's what like I said. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's one of the out. best like meme templates like on the internet, I yeah. think. That is, yeah. outside of that, that is about all I know about that show. Um, so for me, I love, I also love Luther the Anger Translator. It, I like the church lady, he's one where they're in church and they're talking about how they're going to beat the devil's ass. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's, it's, oh, it's so good. Because it's just, it's very graphic and they're just like in church, like in the name of Jesus after I have swear, like all these string of curses. I'm like, I'm going to beat that devil's ass. <laughs> it's just them dressed as grandmas, like old church ladies. It, it's funny. Uh, the valets and uh, uh, what's the valet the, oh, one? The valets is like they're literally there are two valets like at, on they're on a job, but it, like they'll talk about movie trailers with each other. So they'll be like, "Did you see that one with Jason Bourne?" And he did this. Yes, Liam Neeson. Like, yeah, so, <laughs> so like they talk about like Toy Story four that um, promo with the two stuffed animals that they play. Yeah. That's that's from the valet sketch. So like oh. they repeated it back. Yeah, so it was like a nod to Kim Peele. Okay. Um, and then shoot, there was one more. Oh, the one where it's like I said, bitch, and like it's like them saying that they were <laughs> around their um, wives, and they're like, yeah, and I told her, and they move away, and they they <laughs> whisper like, bitch. <laughs> so it's good. Uh, yeah. For for me, I think the ones I mentioned are, are super good. I didn't realize there was almost three hundred sketches that they did in in that time. Uh, uh but I think outside of the ones that that you guys mentioned, I think there's the one where he goes on the continental breakfast and he's just like eating and he's just so fascinated by a continental breakfast. And I just relate to that one a lot. Cause like when I go to like fancy breakfast at hotels, I feel like, Hmm. hmm. <laughs> and he's just like really enjoying continental breakfast. Uh, I don't know. There's so many, some of like the, the musical ones are really good. Like the Negro town musical is hilarious. Uh, as a teacher, yeah. obviously, like the substitute teacher <laughs> one is one of my favorites. Uh, I don't know. There, there's a bunch. Like, there's just so many really, really good ones. And I will send Kate recommendations to watch them on the YouTubes since they're like all on YouTube at this point because of, like you said, like a lot of the popular ones just got put on YouTube and they just, you know, they're there for you to watch. But all the ones you guys mentioned are are, are super super good. Um, I I watched. I think I was just on YouTube and I think stuff was just auto playing, but there's one about like this, this kid who's like bullying this other kid and just gets like real deep. And he was like, I'm going to take out my thing on my frustrations on you because I don't have any other coping mechanisms. And it's just like a very like seriously, like deep like sketch on how bullying works. I don't know. And, but they just make light of all of it. Oh, there's one. I grew up in El Paso. A lot of my friends were gang members. And I always wondered like, what do they do when they go to like their gang meetings? Like, what do they do? And there's one where he's like, dude, we got to commit more crimes. And it, it's just good. I'm gonna send. I'm gonna send Kate that one because I think Kate would appreciate that one, given our shared history of growing up in <laughs> Latin <laughs> neighborhoods. It's just. It's just stupid. It's exactly what I picture like their meetings to be like in the most obscure way. Um, so there's there's a few. Um, so from that you uh, you get so from Key and Peel. You end up with Key and Peel getting packaged together for pretty much everything from that point until like 2017. So in 2014, they were both FBI agents on the first series of, on the first season of FX's Fargo, which is an anthology series. And then in 2016, uh, Peel starred in and produced with Key the first feature film, which they both had leading roles, which was Keanu. I was going to ask Adrian about that because I haven't seen it, but it looked funny. Yeah, it's it's about what you expect. Uh, it's about what you expect. And kind of like, it's just like a big, long, uh, essentially them just doing like Key and Peele, just like in a, like, a long drama. It's, it's pretty good. I think it's, it's worth the watch. 
So they have a seventy-seven percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, that tracks. It's a pretty good comedy. Like it's it's underrated, I think, for what it is. People are like, oh, it's just Key and Peel doing Key and Peel, but like they're funny. So like I think it I think it works. Mm-hmm. Also, sometimes comedians just need to be themselves in things, and it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a long, but I agree with you, Adrian. It's like a long Key and Peel sketch, which I think is funny. It's like it's like someone who made Good Burger, and they decided, like, it's a sketch. Let's make it a movie now. <laughs> Don't make that face, Matt. We're not going to have your Good Burger hot takes. Good Burger is good. <laughs> good Burger is terrible. Wrong with good burger? Let's move on. Let's move good on. Burger. I'm not going to take Good Burger slander. Um, I'm... I'm not taking good wonder slag- slander. We're just moving on. Let's just go to the next thing because I can't do it. I can't do it. It's so good. Good Burger is awful and terrible. I think I lost no. IQ watching that movie. It's just the age difference. It has to be the age thing. You just. I, I'm hoping. It has to be. Welcome to Good Burger Home of the Good <laughs> Burger. Uh, Again, just two dudes doing dude. the thing and it works. I'm a dude. <laughs> I'm a dude. Come on, man. See, if anything, yeah. Key and Peel copied uh, Keenan and Kel. Yeah, That's basically. What that doesn't help That's your case in my from. case. Because Keenan <laughs> Peel, I did not care for Good Burger. It was awful. And I never understood complete comedy with Keenan and Kel. Funny thing, they technically have the same trajectory because Keenan and Kel started on all that and then went to <laughs> Keenan and Kel and got their own show and then did a movie yep. together. Yep. I didn't care for any of it. It's gonna put you in your childhood with Dave bad. Chappelle and repeat. <laughs> I'd be fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. So from that, Peel co-created uh, the TBS series The Last OG, which stars Tracy Morgan, and he uh, had he led he hosted and produced the CBS All Access revival of the twilight zone which i'll talk about when we get into his horror stuff um because we have a twilight episode that y'all can go listen to where we talk about how the twilight zone kind of cements as a foundation for a lot of folks introduction into sci-fi and horror um but yeah so far as movies key and peel wrote and produced and starred in keanu like i said peel has voice acted in storks captain underpants the first epic movie and toy story 4 and then we go into the heavy hitting stuff, which is the real race. Wait, 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 wait. Storks oh, okay. isn't the heavy hitting stuff? What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> so is this only the ones that include both of them, or how does this work, I guess? Oh, uh, this was for both of them. Okay, because I was like, I'm pretty sure Key's been in a lot more than just this. Yeah, Key is, because this isn't a Key. This well, that's why like, I was confused uh, on yeah. what we were referencing from. Yeah, you said this that- is just for both. Yeah, this is just for them. Okay. Because P- P- Jordan Peele is the focus of this episode, not Key and Peele. But what about Dave Chappelle? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> anyway, for only being in the horror game for three years, this man has impacted horror so greatly, both with the monetary value of his films, but also what he's done with uh, small production companies and different models. So in 2017, um, Jordan Peele made his directorial his directorial debut with Get Out, which is a horror film, and it was both critically and it had both critical and box office success. This came out of left field because nobody expected him to do horror at all. In fact, when they started promoing this, because it was one of Blumhouse's few theater films. Um, people didn't think it was going to be good because he was a comedian. But one of the things that I really like and that I think um, Jordan Peele really hones in on is the fact that in order to pe- make people laugh, you need to know how to make them feel. You need to make them empathize with the situations that are happening. And if you don't do that, you can't make somebody laugh. Horror does the exact same thing but for fear if you can't empathize with the characters if you can't empathize with the situation and if you can't get involved for like rooting for them then you can't get scared by the things that are happening for them so horror and comedy are really two sides of the same coin they do different things but they use the same motive and that's why i think jordan peele is able to be able to do this so effectively especially with the types of films that he's been doing and the types of projects he's been producing because they take into account that social commentary aspect that really allows you to get people put like in it um 
He received a lot of accolades for this, but the the biggest one is the fact that he won the Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay for Get Out, and then uh, he got noms for Best Picture and Best Director as well. Um, he also received another Academy Award nomination for Best Picture because he produced Spike Lee's Black Klansman. And then he also wrote, directed, and produced Us, which it is not surprising that they didn't get any, any nominations because it's horror and they had to overcorrect for the pre for the 2017 year, but that film deserved something at least for acting. Yes. Filipino um, man goes robbed. Oh yes, she had two completely different performances. Um, but yeah, so ultimately, in my opinion, and kind of goes to what Matt kind of said, he. Peel didn't do anything groundbreaking in comedy. He was a comedian, and he was a good comedian, but he didn't, like, set new bars, push new things. He was just really good. Um, but when it comes to horror, he, in, within their current era of horror, he probably has the largest impact, bar none, for the trajectory that the industry is going. Um, so we covered James Wan at the start of October, and James Wan's career, one, is longer in horror, um, but he also defines what theater horror looks like. And for Jordan Peele on this other side, you've, you're starting to see a, flur a flurry of projects being greenlit and projects succeeding um, because of Get Out. Um, and a lot of that also has to do with Bloomhouse, which we also talked about this month. It's all coming together. Um, so for me, when I think about who is actually shaping horror for like the last two decades or the last decade, um, for the 2010s, it's James Wan. And when I look into this last piece, this current era, it's definitely Jordan Peele into a lighter, like a lighter respect Ari Aster, but mostly Jordan Peele, um, because his films are just more accessible. And a lot of the reason that this happens is because of social horror. So social horror or social thrillers are films that take into account societal issues, problems, and fears. And while that's kind of the base for what horror does, like, ever, like The Exorcist is reflective of how everybody was scared that everybody was moving away from Catholicism in Reagan's era. That's something it's reflective of, but it's not the main focus the main focus is a little girl who's possessed but the underlying commentary is this but when you watch a jordan peele film it's not the underlying quality uh, uh, the underlying thing which is what social horror is it's not about what's underneath it's it's in the forefront um and so while this has been an existing genre sub -genre within horror and thrillers more largely we had kind of seen it wane a little bit and moving into all of that um moving into all of the um the james wan films right supernatural jump scares like all of the those those thrills that you get and we have moved we had moved away a little bit from the more thoughtful and visceral horror um and with get out we see ourselves coming back to it and that's because essentially get out is a it's a look at racism but it's not a look at overt racism right it's not a look at the people with a confederate flag it's a look at the people who use microaggressions and would have voted for obama the third time which is a very different look but this is also one of the reasons why it succeeds and i at the time when it came out i was listening to a lot of horror podcasts and one of the things that came up a lot, because a lot of the, the majority of the, I think almost all of them had all white hosts, was that when they watched the film, it made them so deeply uncomfortable because they realized that they had said some of those things that the family had said. And I'm not saying like the bad things, but just those small, uh, you could be an athlete or like all of those, like the microaggressive, what, what, what the people saying see as a compliment, but the people receiving definitely know is not and is definitely singling them out because of their race. And the fact that Jordan Peele asks you to come into the situation and not only confront what you kind of push away, but also make you empathize with a person who doesn't look like you 
that is something that is huge because his film does two things for white audiences it calls them out on the stuff that they do and it makes them empathize with the black character and then for black audiences and people of color it presents a catharsis from that moment that they have to experience all the time when they're in the world yeah yeah yeah. I, I don't I don't have the breath to talk about uh, social horror. I was gonna ask like what because you said he brought it back like what is another example of like a social horror movie that's like big before this that Night of the Living Dead. Yeah, I was gonna ask if Night of the Living Dead, but I was like, is yeah. that isn't that a Mike Mouse? I mean, uh, yeah, okay, that's what I thought, but I wasn't I wasn't sure. I didn't want to. Yeah, Night of the Living Dead because that one. So zombies are this weird thing, and it also has to do with how like the directors see it. So for George A. Romero. Night of the Living Dead's main focus was the way that we other each other. Um, and then he pulls mm. that in and it gets it gets farther away as you go into zombie lore. It's just zombies versus like this is a critique of who we are as people and how we turn on each other and that kind of stuff. Um, but Night of the Living Dead is one. Um, people Under the Stairs is another. Um, so like essentially it was never a lot of like 60s and 70s horror, 70s horror reflects it. So, like, um, Rosemary's Baby is a, probably another good example. Um, Does Purge but... count? <laughs> yes, the Purge is actually social horror, yes. Okay, gotcha. gotcha. Yeah. Because <clears throat> um, the, the goal of social horror is to take something that is real and essentially the topics you don't talk about at the dinner table, right? Like religion, politics, race all those things and bring it to the forefront and talk about the anxieties and the fears that revolve around those things. Yeah. Um, right. Now we're seeing it happen a lot. Yeah. Get out's great. It's, I think it's the only horror movie that I've seen twice, like more than one time in a movie theater. I went back multiple times to see it. I need to see it again. I need to see it again. I need to see all like little things in it. Uh, it's just that it's, a... it's just a good movie. Like I think it, it's like one mm-hmm. of those things that kind of goes above what it is. Just a good movie. It's the first movie that I went and like, I wanted to see this movie so bad, but I got tired of waiting for people to go because they're like, we'll go next weekend when we're free. I'm like, screw it. I'm going to go by myself because like, I used to like not go to movies by myself. But then I was like, screw it. <laughs> I'm going to go by myself to this movie. And I went and then I went like a three times more because it's so good. What were some of your favorite, what were some of y'all's favorite parts from it? Um, I think, I'll, like, I mean, I know it's like <laughs> we like nixed the whole M. Night Shyamalan episode because it's like funny to make fun of him. But the twist at the end is just so good. Like it's it's just fantastic, and I I, I do as much as like M Night Shyamalan like now is is ridiculous. I do like twists, and twists are good. And Get Out has mm-hmm. one of like the best ones I think in in anything I can think of. Like off the top of my head, and in like recent in pretty recent memory. So I think it's the twist for me, and the, you know the mother F and T S A. I agree. Um, no, I agree. It's like that ending when like, first off, when you find out that like he wanted it to end in another way, it really is like terrifying. And I'm like, I'm so glad they didn't. Um, but like, I, I, it's definitely the microaggressions. Like it does a really great job of capturing them. Yeah. 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 That was, that was one of the things when I watched it that the microaggressions were just like oh wow i've been around these people especially at ut it was one of those things where you like it very overtly like lets you know oh yeah all those things that you let slide and don't think about definitely mean something else (laughs) um when you're actually interacting with folks and i think i think for me my favorite part was that you could feel jordan peele's love of the things that came before him in the film and that's actually one of the reasons why i love him as a director because it is very much influenced by the stepford wives um so that's actually you can see that when they use the camera and the camera disrupts the the hypnosis because the cameras a camera is also used in the stepford wives for kind of the same reason um And there's just a knowledge of the genre and what happens in it that's really good. Like Nisha said, he wanted to have the initial ending be that Rose essentially wins and the cops pull up instead of Rod. Um, 
And that would have been more real, but when he talks about it, he kind of explains that, like, he's just put his audience through hell, so he didn't want to put them through it even further. Oh, no, um, I remember viscerally, like, in the theater being like, oh, are you are you kidding me? I was, I was like, already getting angry in the movie theater like, during, during the end of that, which is why the I TSA screamed. line is so good. <laughs> I screamed the first time, and I was, like, very loud. I'm like, no way. <laughs> Because you really think it's going that way. And then, like, there's that deleted scene of the ending. And I'm like, I didn't even want to watch I don't even want to watch it. Because yeah. I'm just like, I don't want to get upset. But it's like, um, what's that one movie that came out? Queen and Slim? Like, mm-hmm. that ending. I was kind of like, you know what? I really appreciate Jordan Peele for deciding to change his ending. Because, yeah, you've already put me through a lot. <laughs> Can I get, like, some st- something of a happy ending, please? Dude's already scarred for life. Never going to trust anyone ever in his entire life after this. No. Yeah, <laughs> never. And I also think Get Out is a really good example because I think some of the reasons why Get Out succeeds is because uh, in Peel's comedy, he, sh- he showed how to kind of use those elements. So what I did look up is I did look up the hoodie sketch from Key and Peel. I don't know if you all remember that one. He's walking mm-hmm. in a white neighborhood with uh his hoodies down and like all the kids are going in and the cops pulling up he pulls his hoodie up and it's a white it's like the side of a white guy on his on his thing Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. and like that is actually kind of similar to the opening of get out but yeah get out does a lot and one of the things that that happens with it when when he um when he wins for best original screenplay he's actually the first african-american to win the award um and he said, I want to dedicate this to all the people who raised my voice to let me make this movie. And this goes into another reason why Jordan Peele has so has been so big in horror is that for him, it's never just about him and his films. He's always looking to give somebody the next opportunity, which is like really rare to see like shining stars do because most of the times they just they just swoop up all the stuff, which like. They got to make money, so I don't blame them. But, like, Peel, like, routinely passes the mic to other people and Greenlight's projects. Then you have Us, which is his second uh, his second film. It was the highest opening weekend for an R-rated film since 10. Uh, since 10, when, when you're only looking at original IP. Um, and then if you take out original IP, it's second to um, MCU films. Uh, so Deadpool. Well, that's not, that's not even an MCU. Yeah, Don't that's you just MCU. disgrace Deadpool like that? Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's second to Deadpool. Um, but it also has the best opening for a horror film in history. It's the highest grossing horror film from a new IP. So an original IP. The reason I say this is because we've talked about it a whole bunch. If you look at the highest grossing horror films, they are all sequels. Or they are all adaptations of a Stephen King thing. <laughs> Makes um sense. yeah so us breaks a lot of records it's opening was 70 million dollars it uh it this was the third weekend that captain marvel was out and it kicked it out of the top spot um also captain marvel was bad and had one of the worst drops off, drop offs for people so that that's also why but this was also just very good um and ultimately this movie was a critique of uh, classism and culture and a big old love letter, letter to horror films. Um, so when Jordan Peele talked about the movie, he said, this is a movie about this country. We're in a time where we fear the other, whether it's the mysterious invader who he thinks gonna come, uh, who's going to come and kill us and take our jobs, or the faction we don't live near who voted a different way than us. We're all about pointing the finger. And I... And I wanted to suggest that maybe the monster we really need to look at has our face. Maybe the evil is us. And the premise of the film is it's all about doppelgangers. Um, And a couple of people were frustrated with Peel for not doing any overt talks about race and class. Because the main family in it is a black family. But they don't really have, other than making jokes with the white family that they're next to, there isn't some overt talk about racism or, like, the intersection of race and class. Um, Mm -hmm. But when Peel talked about that, he said, this black family owns a boat. 
that that's a, like you need to normalize that you need to normalize people in the middle class that look like this and that's my comment like stop asking me to do other things um and so yeah ultimately this these two are not a part of the franchise together they're not going to be made they're not going to have sequels made out over after them Jordan Peele has already stated he's not going to make sequels for his films, which I am very happy about because I'm tired of sequels as a horror fan. Um, but yeah, what did you guys think about Us? Um, I like Us. Us is scarier than the other one, so I've only seen it once because Lupita is just way too good in this movie for me not to like think about it for the rest of the day uh after after i watched it but us is us is good man like winston duke is fantastic everybody's good in it like you know, when you you said it like at the top that people should have got awards that everyone in this movie is basically playing two clear, clearly opposite roles like everybody in the movie is doing something different and it's just really well acted um story's good i think i've only since i've only seen it once i think some of the stuff at the end kind of goes over my head like i have way too many questions on like how does this thing happen matt would absolutely hate this movie for like the last you know, 20 minutes of it when they're yes, like doing the all the exposition of disbelief. Yeah. yeah they, the, ex the exposition at the end, I'm just like, but how did they, how are they all alive for who's feeding them? Why are they the same size as everybody else when they are only eating rabbits? Like I, a lot of that stuff to me doesn't make sense, but I don't, I don't know. I, I maybe, I don't know. Maybe I'm just dumb and I just don't get it. But the, the story as a whole is pretty good. And the acting is like fantastic. Some of like the kills in it are pretty good too. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's just, it's just all pretty good. I think. Um, for me, I, lo I loved us. I don't know. I, I was kind of irritated when a lot of people were making all the comments of like, oh, no, I see what he's doing here. I'm like, no, he literally said it's a horror movie, y'all. Like, <laughs> And like, I don't know. It's like when a director tells you what something is and they're like, but I wanted it to be this and I expected it to be that. I'm like, just enjoy it for what it is and like what they said, it, what it's about. And the, the story is good by itself. Like, I didn't think he had to. Like, it didn't need to be get out to. And I think that's what everybody wanted it to be. But I'm like, I enjoyed it because, like you said, it's a love letter to horror. It's really good. Everyone is phenomenal in it acting wise. And yeah, I'm not going to lie. I was definitely that person of like, OK, but like what's going to happen after this? Then I you just you got to let it go. Like there's no sequels. Yeah. And, and it is one of those things, too. I'm like glad you brought it up is it's like a blessing and a curse that Jordan Peele like re-sparked social horror. And mm -hmm. he's he he plans to do more of those. So he said, I have four other social thrillers that I want to unveil over the next decade. The best and scariest monsters in the world are human beings that we are capable and, and what we are capable of, especially when we get together. I've been working on these premises about these different social demons, these innately human monsters that are woven into the fabric of how we think and how we interact. And each one of my movies is going to be about a different one of these social demons. And so he very much wants to do that. But what mm -hmm. I think people need to understand, and, and this is what happens with anybody coming off of a really successful feature debut, is the follow-up people are let down because they want it to just be that other thing or they expect them to do something more overt. So the curse side is that he's people are always looking to him for the next grand commentary on race in America and like the next... like super deep trippy thing and he's just kind of like sometimes i just want to make a horror movie where i reference the lost boys and thriller and <laughs> make all your favorite songs spooky um mm -hmm. and yes. so for a lot of the stuff that he has plans and a lot of the stuff that he he that he has greenlit um it kind of diverges from that but it makes me happy because he's getting to do what he wants um because at this point, people just give Jordan Peele money to do things. One of the other but why those and ultimately for his, his impact on horror is diversity in horror, specifically when it comes to black stories. Um, horror has, when it comes to diversity in horror, there are a lot of female leads. That said, there are hardly any people of color at all. Um, and we all, and everybody makes a joke that, that it's because the white people get scared and run towards the thing. And they're dumb. And Accurate. that's why people of color aren't in these movies. <laughs> because they would just run out the house. <laughs> um, I mean, I literally and... made that joke last night when I was watching a scary movie. I'm like, I wouldn't go in there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
so. But um, the cool thing is, is what we're seeing a lot of happen after, specifically after the success of Get Out, because, and we talked about it in our Bloom House episode, Get Out was made on $5 million, and it made $100 million just in the box office. That doesn't count anything that it made after. Um, Us is a very similar feat. And so you're getting to, you're getting to see the investment and because their original IPs, and I know Matt's talked about this in the past on the show, of like, no, this is a new story. It's a diverse story. And we can prove that it is actually selling these things. So please green light it in horror where everything is kind of, it tends to be an iteration on something else. It, it's really pushed the way. And because him and his production company, Monkey Paul, have been working with uh, Bloomhouse. They've been opening a lot more doors for young directors and directors of color. Um, and uh, when you talk, to, when, when Peel has been asked about it, um, he said, the way I look at it, I get to cast black people in my movies. I feel fortunate to be in a position where I can say to Universal, I want to make a $20 million horror movie with a black family. And that may sound small but this is actually something that a lot of other directors with diverse backgrounds get a lot of heat for it's my one critique i have of my my director theo guillermo del toro he he doesn't actually cast a lot of mexicans in his movies and he doesn't actually cast a lot of people with brown skin in his movies um, and Jordan Peele has made a conservative effort to not necessarily say you have to do this thing, but just be like, I'm in this position and I'm going to use my platform to uplift other people like me in the genre, which I think is really, really commendable. Um, that being said, there are a lot of black horror films that, that have come out or are coming out in 2020 or were supposed to come out in 2020. Uh, Antebellum, Spell, Candyman was supposed to come out in 2020. That's also produced by Peele. Um, but it's coming out in 2021 now. Black Box, His House, Bad Hair. Um, and that's just this year. And we're seeing a lot more on the slate come, going forward as well. Um, while this may not seem significant, the fact that they're not all Bloomhouse titles is really, really big. Because when it, when it comes to diversity in horror film a lot of the times it were those small indie babies coming out out of Bloomhouse and now you're ending up with larger studios actually investing in these stories with leads that aren't white. Um, and that that's a really big move and something I don't think we see without Get Out's like gigantic success. So obviously I haven't seen Us or um, even Get Out at this point, but I've been waiting because obviously I knew we were probably going to get to the diversity in horror, but I like to use Us whatever because us to me is the biggest example because we talked that's because i think kate kind of mentioned of like when it comes to everybody yelling diversity sells and everything else it's one of those we don't actually get to see that and but us shows us all that because it's an original ip because when people tell me oh i you know i slapped the mcu sticker on it, or i slapped a star wars sticker on it or something they tell me this i'm like i don't really care i can slap a star wars sticker on it and sell it with whoever i want it does, you're not telling me diversity sells. You're just telling me the MCU or Star Wars sells. But us at this point, mm. literally with the original IP, you have a whole black family. You have a you know Lapita is fantastic in this movie, as we all said. You meet everything of like and how much money this movie makes. This one literally shows, and why I feel like us as much as it is important, you know, from the horror genre, but as a whole of what you're looking for as in diversifying stories, us should be your prime example of what should yeah. do it. I don't care about Star Wars mm. and Ray. I'm sorry. I guess what I could have chose Ray we could have chose anybody Star Wars is still gonna sell you know same thing with the MCU people always yell at the same time Captain Marvel came out and they're like Mar woman did that I'm like what are you talking about every MCU movie makes a billion dollars right now you're not telling me anything new you're just telling me that yeah, people I mean. like the MCU versus us we get a new original IP led by a black family and with a black woman basically probably who should have won awards from everything I've heard about this movie mm -hmm breaking all the records and even in horror or whatnot else. But if there isn't ever mm -hmm. a movie you should point to for diversity cells and what you should focus on, it should be us. Yeah. And I think, I think the other record that it broke was, uh, this is the highest grossing film with a black woman lead. Right. And then I said, mm -hmm. and obviously as well. and much as it doesn't make a billion dollars, it is rated R. So like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it doesn't, uh, I mean, and, and I know we're talking about us a whole bunch here. Right. But, didn't Get Out make more money? 
It made no. more on return. Yeah, it made more. Yeah. Yeah. It so get Man, so box office spent, mojo. I hate you. I know we haven't talked about you in a long time. <laughs> box office mojo. But no. So <laughs> this is why uh, I hate so, you. So so us uh, us essentially made more money, but it was made for a higher budget. Get Out made more mm. money because it was a lower budget film. Yes. Gotcha. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also, just to bring up the mm-hmm. fact that, like, this went out with the weekend of yeah. Captain Marvel, and basically that movie dropped off really bad. Yeah. Uh, because essentially, to put it in perspective, Adrian, Us made $100 million on its entire theatrical run. Or, no, uh, sorry. Get Out made $100 million its entire theatrical run. Us made $70 million its first weekend. Yes. Gotcha. I'm still going to box off his mojo because I'm curious. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> That's fine. But yeah, not, so that, I, not that I'm point, saying you're wrong. I'm just, I'm just no, curious no, no, to see no, what the I, numbers yeah. are, to see how close they are. But yeah, no, I, to Matt's point, I think I think it's a really good point because we often forget the fact that like we need to, as much as we need more diversity in these things, we need, the, the, in my opinion, the best way to do that is to green light more original IP. Green, I, green light more original stories because they're naturally going to be different they're going to be new and that's mm. kind of what jordan peele has done with the exception of Candyman. but i give leeway to that just because Candyman was told not from the perspective it's being told from now and it's a very different story when you do that and the original candy man was based on a book anyway mm-hmm. but I don't know. I just know we look at us. I mean, if you want to count, get out, and that's fine too, whatever. But the end day of like these two movies in general, I think, are just way better examples of diverse. Yeah. The diversity sells argument, other than giving me the new sequel trilogy, giving me a Captain Marvel mm-hmm. movie, even giving me the Ghostbusters or Ocean's Eight or whatever crap we're gonna just slap other things on with stickers. Yeah. Or even the M- M- Men in mm-hmm. Black that we had this past year, like. Yeah. What's gonna? Oh, I agree. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. Because you're right, if something had Star Wars on it and you were just like, if they were to tell us um, Oscar Isaac is going to do a Poe Dameron series, it's gonna, like people are going to watch that and tune in because it's Star Wars. Yeah. But if I were to find out that like, here's this I, original idea, I mean, not saying I don't want that, I wouldn't want that. But <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I think the best, the best example for this is Solo failed. Solo yes. failed. Yeah. At three hundred and ninety three point two million dollars of box office. That's in the U.S. Solo it made, failed, and it failed in as US. in a global. It made almost seven hundred million. Yes, and it. I'm doing bunny ears. I well, I mean that's how they talk about even Ant Man failing at seven hundred yes. million. Like yeah, so like the the margin of error for a film, it, which is also one of the reasons, like, technically these big franchises have no reason to not be diverse, because you're literally gonna make money no matter what. Stop saying it's a risk. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I it, it's also one of the reasons why I really love horror and I love things that are happening in horror. It's why I wanted to do the Bloomhouse episode and why, like, I really wanted to do a Peel episode is because we see this starting to shift because right now the micro like in the time of covid this current structure that peel and bloomhouse have been working under is going to be perfect for producing more movies for streaming services which means we're going to get more diverse films and we're going to get more diverse stories told and because they like it is easier to make original ip now and license that than like deal with what's happening with james bond right now where they're trying to sell the entire franchise and the entire thing for a streaming platform like that's a lot harder versus doing original stuff and so a lot of what get out did as well is it led to it it led to the types of films that we see in bloom houses into the dark series which is the anthology series on hulu Mm -hmm. this is where you get some of the really heavy hitting heavy hitting social commentary my favorite of which being culture shock which is stepford wives meets the matrix all about border crossing and it is terrifying to watch and really really good gg uh gg sacedo did that one um i highly recommend people look at it look at it um, and while there hasn't necessarily been an explosion of horror for other um, other ethnic minorities, um, we are starting to see more stuff come to light because social horror is opening it up for things beyond just the traditional stories that we get. So we're seeing films like The Cleansing Hour, La Llorona and Shudder, um, and more of 
films having different types of representation coming to the forefront. Um, and I don't think that that gets done without Peel proving proof of concept for, no, I mean, Paranormal Activity proved proof of concept for Bloomhouse, but like proof of concept where you can make good content as well. Um, and Bloomhouse's slate of films that they've been putting out have been extremely diverse, which I think is due in large part to get out success, um, which traces back to Jordan Peele. That's all I have on us. I never watched it. That's all you have on us. (laughs) (laughs) I will circle back. I was correct. Get Out did make more money worldwide and domestically than us did. By a million dollars. Yeah, but the movie's coming out like like before, right? So like it's doing what... My my only thing is like I think us did it faster, obviously, right? But that's because of like how well Get Out did. So I think Get Out is like the... Also, cool. don't look up the number, like the top ranking thing for rated R movies in the domestic because it's just a ridiculous list. So, to be it's fair, Passion though, of the Christ, you know, Deadpool, American Sniper, Joker, It, Deadpool 2, we, we already knew The Matrix Reloaded, The Hangover. Yeah, we already knew. Yeah, no, like, <laughs> what is yeah, we that were, list? Yeah, no, that list is. Passion of the Christ? Yeah, no, it's yeah. Passion of the Christ. No, Passion of the Christ made $370 million domestically we've talked about, in 2004. We've talked, about, we've talked about that before in some of our episodes of how that's the most random rated R whatever circle jerk movie ever. Yeah, yeah. that is insane. Also, but apparently out, it looks like. But apparently, also, Get Out has also done two re releases, by the way. Oh, that's where that money comes from. Mm. Oh, well, not really. I mean, it's, it's seven thousand dollars and thirteen thousand dollars. Oh yeah, that's not that much then. Fifty-three. Anyway, it's good and they make money. Yeah, they make yes. lots of money. <laughs> even have at a money. bigger, because even at a bigger budget, get uh, us is still only twenty million. Yeah, that's twenty million not... and f- what four million something and change. Yeah. Like that's that's insane. Like return. Uh, my question, I know you're going to talk about this like in the next like Monkey monkey Paw Productions that we have on the notes here. Uh, I, I might miss it, what you said earlier. Did he create Monkey Paw? Is, it, like, that's, is yes. that his baby fully? Yes, so Monkey awesome. Paw is his baby. It's his production company. He formed it, I think, during when Get Out was being done. Bloomhouse gave him that piece. And then Monkey Paw has been working hand-in-hand hand with Bloomhouse for some stuff. Um, the majority of their completely uh, like showcased stuff that's been announced Candyman, black clansman lovecraft country with bad robot and hunters have all already come out they've all been six well no Candyman hasn't come out but like we know it's it's done it's not gonna go you know why it then come out because you can only watch that movie in a movie theater once it's done with the movie theater you need to just burn the entire film because you're not allowed to watch it it makes me so angry that that's how directors are thinking DVD shouldn't exist. You shouldn't get any money for DVDs because you only want Especially to be seen Especially for theaters. a movie where the entire thing is speaking somebody's name into a mirror. That's like ten times scarier when I'm at home. Yeah. I'm going to go sit in the closet when you watch that movie just so when you pop out to go to the bathroom, I can go there. <laughs> it's terrible. Were you Record in Host when you, do when it. you did that? Were you, were you in the community night with Host when yes. you did that? I was. I was. I mean, you just screamed out loud. Adrian, that was hilarious. we were watching. It was our horror night, and we were watching Host. And I had just gotten scared, and then Matt walked into my room like a freaking cat and scared me from behind, and I got more scared. And then everybody <laughs> in the call yelled because they hilarious. got scared. And then something scary actually happened on the team. It was. It was a lot. It was a lot. To it process. was like twenty minutes of everybody screaming. <laughs> Good it job, was man. a lot to process. Good job. And then laughing. The best one is Kate came in the room and she was like, I can't look at mirrors right now. And I was like, guess what? That bathroom, you can see through the closet from the mirror. And so then she like just basically said, I'm not closing any doors. Yeah, I mean, I want to, I want to chastise you, man, but that's definitely me whenever somebody watches anything anything remotely scary. I just yell cuckoo for like the rest of the day <laughs> and until night. And then, so, so it works. That's like um, me after like our community watch nights. I'd just be like looking around all the corners when I don't have the light, like right there where you can oh, yeah, see that door. Oh yeah, you look alone, Nisha. You live alone. Mm-hmm. And then That'll I just forget, fun. and I'll look behind me like, oh shit. What if there's? Something? I mean, like all them doors back there where people just keep moving all the lights. Yeah, we can all see back in there. What? Wait, you don't live with watching... somebody? I thought you lived with somebody. Yeah, we can see somebody in the back. Yeah. You know? That's my own place. Oh, why are lights turning what? on then? Yeah. What? 
Where are the lights at? I can see in your house. Huh? <laughs> but yeah, so uh, Monkey Paw Productions is his baby. Um, and from that, you have Candyman, Black Klansman, Lovecraft, Lovecraft, Count, Lovecraft Country, which is made with Bad Robot, and then Hunters, which was made for Amazon Prime. Everything on here, obviously, with the exception of Candyman, because that hasn't come out yet, because... It's made for theaters. Film. film has to be made for theaters, and you can't watch it at home, and I hate that decision. Um, has gotten really good... I, it's gotten critical acclaim. They've succeeded, and Black Klansman won an Academy Award. So, like... <laughs> He's, he's doing good things. Um, additionally, what he he also brought back the Twilight Zone. This isn't this has mixed reviews. Um, I think it just hurt because it was on CBS All Access and not a lot of people mm -hmm. had access to C CBS All Access. Um, but mm -hmm. Peel brought back Rod Serling's timeless sci-fi horror drama show, The Twilight Zone, pretty much as a passion project because it was one of his favorite, one of his cornerstones in his development as a kid and a creator and a storyteller and he serves as creator writer executive producer and host of that show like that that is as much as baby as monkey paw is if we're honest mm -hmm. um the cool thing with twilight zone is that it's given a lot of opportunities to uh young directors and up and coming uh stars as well so it and and because because it's peel a lot of it all of it is diverse and i'm talking about like diverse diverse like there are people from different types of backgrounds different people in the focus different people directing from the writer's room to the direct directorial and stars um so it, it's been really good people people really like it so i've seen that fans really like it and critics were like meh on it um but again, think CBS All Access. It's hard to sell. Um, it's hard to sell a whole streaming platform for like two shows. Pretty much. Yeah. Um, and then uh, you also have the fact that he had with the Us trailer with I Got Five on it, which was uh, so him and Michael Abel's uh, reimagine Luna's I Got Five on it for the theme of Us, and it's terrifying. Um, he also uses good vibrations while the family is getting beat to death. Um, <laughs> and you essentially have him using these really fun songs for really dark things. And now everybody is doing it. Um, although the other one that you can say he's behind is he was behind, um, the Say My Name usage, Destiny's Child's Say My Name in the Candyman trailer. Hmm. Also really terrifying. Um, but a I lot of it. horror movies are doing that now. Um, and that kind of starts with us. The best one still when I believe they used the Us theme song and put it over Disneyland opening. That was terrifying. Mm. Did you see that, Nisha? No, I did not. <laughs> yeah, so it was when uh, Disney did their welcome back thing after COVID and somebody put... Uh, I got five on it to it, and it's it's really terrifying. Um, I'm gonna watch that. Yeah, uh, and then in 2017, as a fun fact, uh, Peel was included on the annual 100 list of most influential people in the world for time. And just my own personal favorite thing, he is a horror fan who makes horror films, and that's something that has kind of been chided in the past. That's something that's been chided on in the past just because a lot of people... It goes back to fan service and Easter eggs and all this stuff. Personally, I feel like it's coming back because of how Us was done and how well Jordan Peele did it. I, I love seeing films in a genre made by people who love it because they show an understanding of it. Um, so that's just something that's kind of come with Jordan Peele's feel, feel, film making. Um, but yeah, any thoughts on any of those things? It's like a final thought or like just on the things you just said? No, just the things I just said. Uh, I watched like one episode of the Twilight Zone, the new one, and I was like, nope, this is just like I remember when I was a kid. And some of these episodes are just, just not, just not, it's not made for me. <laughs> but also like, also I didn't have CBS, I only got CBS All Access because of like family stuff. So I didn't even have it myself. So I think you're right that. 
it probably would have been bigger if it was on something not just a streaming service that's not accessible to everybody. It's a, ter- it's a, it's a terrible name, CBS All Access, but only if you have access to it. It's a stupid name. <laughs> Yeah, it's the yeah, only reason I turn it on is because of Star Trek. Really, the only reason. Mm-hmm. Well, that's for me. I like. I think I've seen everything of Jordan Peele since it's when it's come out. Like, I am upset about Candyman, also, but we don't have to get back into that because um, <laughs> it's very upsetting. But uh, no, I, I my favorite thing is that with like with the music, with the songs, like because I want him to make all of them and I just want a playlist dedicated to like the ho- the horror song like the popular pop songs that he made like now it's the horror songs that Beyonce like the Mar- one is terrifying <laughs> yeah, that so, Beyonce so, so, was real terrifying instead of like the Mariah yeah, Carey like it. Christmas album it's just the Jordan Peele Halloween album Could oh you my imagine God, a I- Christmas horror yes so we need Jordan Peele to make a Christmas horror movie with all I want for Christmas is you as the song. That'd be really good, And it good, could be actually. someone who's just obsessed and ready to kill somebody. It's like, all I want for Christmas is you as a stab. Dang. Bill it. <laughs> Give us our royalties, <laughs> Jordan. <laughs> just gave oh, you your next God, $300 million movie right there. Mariah is always looking to be ready to make money off that song. It's perfect. <laughs> 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 is there a song that you have in mind that you really want him to do, Nisha? Oh, God, there's so many. Come back to me. You have Matt say something. <laughs> Matt, any thoughts on what I just said? Okay, Nisha, back to you. Lovely Day by Bill Withers. Oh, uh, okay. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be, no, oh, God. That's actually really terrifying because I've already heard that song used for scary things before, but Ooh. not changed. Just lovely day while like bad stuff is happening is how mm-hmm. I've heard it before. Just change up the tempo slightly, but keep the deep, sultry voice still. That would be great. So, yes. <laughs> that I just like the just ser- position. Yeah. Oh my god, that could be a theme song for a serial killer, actually. Like just going through and like cleaning up stuff, just and then like walking slashing, out. just having the time of his life. The, the Getting their equipment time of his together. Life. <laughs> oh, oh, Jordan gosh. Peele, hire me, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean that's really all I have for Jordan Peele as a whole. I mean, we're going to see what he does next and how he continues to impact horror. But I think when we're looking at whether we're talking about diversity in film and like the need to present more diverse stories and the fact that we have we have data that tells you that diverse a diverse thing will sell. Make make us these things, please. Mm -hmm. Um, And the fact that he's really revamped social horror and pushed it to the forefront again um i am excited for everything we're gonna see him do it's only been three years since get out so we have a long time to see the impact and i predict it's gonna be akin to james wan's impact when it comes to film uh specifically horror um so i'm excited um what's everybody else's last you know final thoughts on on horror nisha you go last because you're the guest my final thoughts, obviously, I always remember Jordan Peele for Key and Peele, which is apparently not Keen and Peele, and it's definitely not the D- Dave Chappelle show, but apparently I remember all the skits, and obviously it existed as in it was a successful show for the three years that it was on, and switching up format, despite switching up formats after the first year. Um, as far as the horror stuff, I mean, they obviously, clearly, people love them, clearly they're successful. I'm probably never going to watch them, but I don't watch a lot of horror movies in general. Um... But no, obviously he has a lot coming out, and so it should be interesting to see what all he gets to do. Because like I said, uh, obviously I already knew about the whole four social thriller things, and I know there's been speculation of like how many different types of social constructs or whatever you want to talk about that he wants to hit on. Because as you mentioned, like he explicitly just didn't want to do one or the other. He wanted to touch on like almost all of them that he could. Yeah, you didn't expect us to have that good of final thoughts, did you? Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're coming in strong in this horror episode. What's up? I This entire episode is my final thought, as I usually say. I just really love Jordan Peele. I love what he's doing. I love what he's created for... The face of horror is no longer a petite brunette woman. Um, and that's really dope. Um, 
that's still what it is for Star Wars, though. <laughs> anyway, Nisha. Um, for me, yeah, I just I love that Jordan Peele when he first came out. For when I mean, you just think of him like he's just this funny dude who, who does comedy, and he kind of just like flips everything on his on his head with horror. And I love that he does that. I love that he really does it uplift other people and their projects as he's going along with his. And I just love, I, I can't wait for Candyman to finally come out in theaters and when it's safe to go to theaters and see that. But I love everything else that he's come out with for. I feel like he can, I just want him to continue to create it and do however, whatever that man wants to do. Let him be happy making his horror thing the way he wants to. Um, but I just feel like he's really contributed to what horror is for like a, an entire generation of people. I would, I would be as bold to say that. So, yeah. Mazer, you head to stjude.org slash but why though and donate to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Doing so, you'll be able to make me sing a karaoke song. Make me do a TikTok dance. Make me do a mystery challenge from the St. Jude Play Live challenge box. And if we hit our goal of $5,000, you'll even get a chance to choose what color I dye my hair. So again, Head on over to stjude.org slash B-U-T-W-H-Y-T-H-O. That's it. That's the episode. Thank you so much, Nisha, for coming on and talking about Jordan Peele with us. Thank you, Nisha. Thank you, Nisha. Thanks for always coming and talking about Chicago people with us. <laughs> <laughs> and anime. Thanks for having me, y'all. <laughs> Even though I didn't know he was from Chicago. I'm going to go find another famous Chicago person. I know one. Oh. On. I know one. Are you going to say Dave Chappelle? <laughs> <laughs> we is need it, to find is like an anime Dave person. Chappelle? No. Okay. An animator it's from Nisha's Chicago. Nisha's favorite Chicago person. Uh, but yeah, Nisha, why don't you tell everybody where they can find you? Yeah, so y'all can find me if you want to find me um, over on Twitter and Instagram at Nisha Plays. Um, also on the podcast called Did You Have To with Kate, where we talk about anime things and also on So Here What Happened, where I talk about entertainment, movies, books, all that jazz with my co-host Carolyn. And all those are part of the But Why Though podcast community and Geek Community Network. Yay! And if you want to support us a little bit more, head on over to patreon.com slash butwhythoughpc. And you can find us on all of our social media at butwhythoughpc. PC and you can find me at Oh Mammoth Randier. Matt. <laughs> oh, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> what is this episode? Are we in the upside down? <laughs> She's a doppelganger. That's not the real Kate. That's what this is. <laughs> you can find me on Twitter <laughs> at Super Reese 93 S U P E R R U I Z 93. Matt. Dave Chappelle will always be superior to the other show.